Good morning. If you will please take your hymnals in preparation for our opening hymn, number 384, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. That's 384. Please stand in body or spirit. seated. Good morning. My name is David. I'm one of the pastors here, and it is a joy to welcome you to worship at First United Methodist Church. We hope that you are welcomed here in the peace of Christ and that you experience the peace of Christ as you have gathered in this holy place to worship God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We do have uh, several announcements available for you on the back of your order of service. Before you turn there, if you would please take this opportunity to look at the Pew Isle Center. There should be a pew pad there for you, for you to record your attendance with us this morning in worship. If you're one of our guests, we hope that you will take the opportunity to tell us how we might be in touch with you throughout the week. Thank you for filling out those registration pads. We do have uh, visitor bags available in the North X if you'd like to know more about the ministry of our church, but some of the opportunities are printed in our announcements. I will point out to you that as listed on August 11th, we will have um, several opportunities for our young people. That is the Sunday our third graders will receive their Bibles. They will do this in the bridge service, the 855 service on Sunday, August 11th. If you have a third grader in your family, uh, please contact Sarah Elizabeth Carroll in the church office and let her know that you would like to participate in this. We give third grade Bibles out every year and then they work with their Sunday school teachers to go through the Bible and its important stories throughout that year. They're also given prayer partners for the year. So it is an opportunity for us to prepare for that date. We'll have children's Sunday school open house and then later that afternoon, we will have our uh, blessing of the backpack.
backpacks. This is a fun activity for all of our students to come bring their backpacks. If you're a teacher and have a backpack or uh, work in any kind of profession with a briefcase and would like to have it uh, blessed, we would love to do that. All the pastors will be gathered in the fellowship hall on August 11th. We'll bless those bags individually for each person. We'll put a tag on it with a prayer for the school year or the work year, and it's a great opportunity to also have an ice cream Sunday, even though we don't really need an excuse for that. We're glad we get to do it. As we think about our own congregation and um, how we all have uh, backpacks to come and, and bring them to be blessed here in this great celebration, we also remember those in our community who do not have opportunities to uh, be resourced with their own backpacks. And to that end, this summer we have our second annual Back to School Bash. And this is an opportunity for our church to bless the community in the name of Jesus Christ. Last year, we helped somewhere between 700 and 1,000 students in this area receive a backpack, some of them haircuts, all of them shoes and school supplies, so that they were able to have a right start in their uh, school year. It really makes a difference in the life of a child for them to have the things they are expected to have when they show up for school. We get to offer that to some of our students in this area who do not have the opportunity to go shopping with a loved one or the resources they need to shop. So we let them shop here. If you would like to help us uh, host that shop, you can do so on Saturday, July 27th. It's a great activity to uh, see so many people be blessed by this church or the day before Friday, July 26th. We need help setting up. I, I know how this congregation is so good about showing up whenever we ask you to, and, and I mean that. You do it really well. I'll tell you where we come we're not all that good at. Uh, I don't know if you've ever hosted a party and 12 people reserved and uh, 38 people came. It's a little like that. So it would help us if you would go online and let us know that you're going to help Friday or Saturday so we can assign specific areas to our volunteers. This just lets us prepare ahead of time to make sure that our beautiful and wonderful shop for Christ is made available to the students who will be on our campus Saturday, July 20th. 27th. Also, if you're not able to serve with your hands, uh, we would love to have uh, gifts for the Back to School Bash. As I said, this is our second year of doing it, and uh, we would uh, appreciate any donations towards this particular ministry that you would like to give. One other thing I'll bring to your attention. <coughs> Pardon me. One other thing I'll bring to your attention, if you follow the liturgical calendar, you might wonder why we have white pyramids up here today. And uh, the reason is it has nothing to do with liturgy, but everything to do with the gift. These are new pyramids that uh, we have been blessed with, and they are beautiful. They were used this weekend in a memorial service. And uh, today they dawn our uh, sanctuary in a loving testimony to uh, Anne and Quay Fortner. They are given to the glory of God and in memory of Anne and Quay Fortner by Dr. Thomas M. Fortner. And we want to thank Tom and his family for this beautiful gift. We were uh, in need of new white pyramids, and I do believe these are wonderful. And because this is the first weekend they were used, we left them up so that everyone could could see them and they could be dedicated this last week come to worship arts camp and learn things about liturgy and how to create things like stained glass windows in their craft time and uh, biblical skits that helped communicate I want to thank all of the volunteers who made our first annual worship arts camp possible to uh, Aaron Smith, our director of worship arts, and we're already looking forward to next year's um, attendance and uh, celebration of helping young people learn creatively to express worship to God. It's a joy to have you with us in worship this morning. As you are able, would you please stand for our call to worship, affirmation of faith, and Gloria Patri. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. 
Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. I believe in God the Father, all maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You may be seated. My name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here, and it is always a joy to be in prayer with you and for you. If you do have a prayer need or prayer concern that um, we, we want to know about it, so please let us know. You're welcome to talk to one of the pastors after the service, or in front of you there in the pew back, there is a card. You're welcome to fill it out and place it in the offering plates as they are passed. But today, let us hear the joys and concerns of our congregation. Our Christian love and sympathy go to Bill and Carla Ventrist and their family upon the death of Carla's mother, Ruth Daniel McCollum, who died on July 14th. Our Christian love and sympathy also go to Shirlene Batchelor and their family upon the death of her granddaughter, Tiffany Cobb, who died on July 13th, and her great-granddaughter, Rylan Cobb, who died on July 15th. We continue to hold Ty and Lakin and Cobb in our hearts as they are continuing to receive medical care. A release from the hospital, Beth Harrison, Angela Ziegenfelder McAllister, Randa Judy, Phil Shelley, Steve Francis, and Eva Parker, who are in the hospital at Southeast, as well as Beverly McGregor, who is in the hospital in Savannah, Georgia. With these and all the other concerns on our hearts and on our minds, let us go to God for a time of prayer. Almighty and loving God, you are a God who is indeed making all things new. You formed this world from nothing, created us from the dust of the earth, and you are continuing to form this world. And you have, through the flood, through the law, through the kings, and through our Savior, Jesus Christ, you've made all things new. And so we pray now for a world that is hurting. We pray for those who are sick, who find themselves suffering from illness. Help them to find healing and wholeness again. We pray for those who are in a season of waiting, waiting for a change to come, a job to open, results to be found, answers to questions. Give them peace and help. Let them be able to find patience. For the leaders among us who have decisions to make, hard choices ahead, grant them wisdom and be their guide. For those who are lost, who are wandering from you or maybe waiting to find you for the first time, come into their hearts anew. And for each of us today, continue to hold us in each and every situation. Almighty God, we ask that you would move among us now. May our hearts become new. Bring about a ministry of acceptance and love. Help us to see others as you see them. Help us to love others as you have loved us. Help us to share with all that you have given us. So inspire us to reach out to others, to be generous, to seek understanding. We are people who need renewal, O oh God. So come, Holy Spirit, come. Shape us, move us, change us, transform us, and create in us a heart 
that is one that breaks for the things that break your own. Create in us a spirit that transforms, that others might see your amazing work in us and move us all to action. We pray all of this in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray and continues to teach us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning, our passage of Scripture is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. Hear the word of the Lord. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, 
so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. This scripture concerns how we become better reconciled to God. It teaches us, as Paul often will, the, the proper attitude, the theological mindset that one needs in order to grow nearer to God in faith. The experience, if you will, the feeling of Christ's atonement. This is a big theological word, atonement, um, and sometimes we make more of it than we should. It's simply an invention of two shorter and more simple English words, at one. It is the idea of being made at one with something or someone is atonement. And so we think of Christ's work justifying us to be made at one with God. That is what he does for us. I've had some experience this summer with atonement. It's not necessarily being made at one with God, but being made at one with my three-year-old son, Jacob. Uh, we went on some family uh, excursions, if you will, over the past several weeks. It started with Blue Lake Camp. We uh, helped host a group of 40 people to to the 4th, 5th, and 6th grade elementary kids camp at, uh, in Andalusia at Blue Lake, and our whole family got to go. And Jacob is three. His oldest brother, who's here, Joseph, was actually a camper, but Grace and Jacob were able to go as well with me and Elizabeth. It was a lot of fun. We had a blessed time, but they don't really plan, you know, uh, camps for three-year-olds. And so a lot of the things that Jacob was doing weren't really designed for his age. And so he kind of became like my little shadow, just to make sure, you know, that he didn't get left on the archery range or fly off a blob into a lake when he wasn't supposed to. He had to kind of stick close to me, and, and he did. And he learned that if he was with me, there would be a lot of adventures ahead, but he almost never knew what was coming next. Well, we, we left Blue Lake, and we ended up at uh, Windshape Family Camp, which was a camp just for the five of us for a few days. It's a wonderful ministry uh, that pours into the, the Christian household and family. We got to all be there in North Georgia mountains, and one of the activities we did, because we, again, kind of signed up for things that uh, were really more appropriate for our older children, was we went up to the top of this mountain, and we climbed up to the top of the trees, and then we got in this tree stand that got you really to the top of the trees, and we were going to zip line down through the, the North Georgia mountains. Well, this was appropriate for our 10-year-old Joseph. I mean, he got up there and just locked onto that zip line and went flying. Grace was uh, asked to do a tandem ride with Elizabeth because she's seven and uh, needed to have make sure you know there was an adult there. Jacob was not, according to their printed materials, old enough or heavy enough to do this. But we had made it all the way to the top of the mountain. He was coming down one way or another. And so um, I just said, why don't you carabiner him right here to me and, uh, and, and we'll go down together. Elizabeth wasn't so sure Jacob would be into this, but he, he had become one with Daddy, and so he was going to do it. And we stood up on the top of that tree stand, and the guy gave me one more chance. He said, are you sure this little kid's going to want to do this? And I said, I think so. And, and he said, well, you better hold on to him. And I said, brother, you don't have to worry about me holding on to him. I mean, he had, Jacob had his two claws into my shoulders like you wouldn't believe. His legs were wrapped around my waist. It was like a cartoon. They tied in the back. They were so tight around me. And, uh, and so we start down this zip line, and I've got handprint bruises here and here and little shoe bruises back here, and we're coming down this thing so fast. And about halfway down, he looks at me and says, Daddy, this is not scary. This is fun. Uh, he never let go of me, though. Uh, we, we ended up going from Windshape to Lake Junaluska, uh, where I had a church meeting. It's in the North Carolina mountains, and we were near Sliding Rock. So we took him to Sliding Rock. It's God's water slide. We climbed up to the top of this big wet rock with the waterfall pouring down it. And again, they look at me and say, are you sure this little fella's going down this thing? And, 
he's three but he does look a little small for his age and I said oh he'll be fine he clawed into me again and we slid down sliding rock down the fast way and we hit into that eight feet deep of freezing icy cold water at the bottom of the spring and suddenly like a salamander he was sitting on top of my head you know I was totally immersed and Jacob's up here still latched on but pushing me down so that none of his body gets in the icy cold water and we finally get out of this rock and I tell you what he was at one with me this is what Paul is trying to describe when he says that Christ is reconciling us to God just like Jacob was one with me on that zip line or one with me down sliding rock we are to be made one with our holy and righteous God but we are not always holy and righteous we're the ones that separate ourselves from God the definition of sin and so God has given us out of his great love Jesus Christ to do the work that even when we separate ourselves by our desire for a repentance Christ and his work on the cross can bring us back together can make us one with God this is what Paul is saying when he says God reconciling himself to us through Christ now our final reconciliation of course will be when we are totally one with God in heaven and and that is our great hope and the vision of that gives us great hope and joy and so as faithful Christians, we attempt to experience this ultimate uh, reconciliation each day of our lives as, as we continue to participate in Christ's ongoing making us one with the Heavenly Father in a right relationship with our Creator, with whom we are constantly, by our sin, separating ourselves. Now, as Methodist or Wesleyan people, we believe in free will, so we know that while Christ does the work for our atonement and our reconciliation, we have to desire that work be done for us. We have to choose to accept it. We, we have to believe in it in order for it to work in our lives. Just as the scripture states, we are given these two ways or really commands for how we might better accept Christ's offering of reconciliation. First, allow ourselves to be transformed by our faith. And secondly, we must become ambassadors for Christ. It is in our new creation and becoming Jesus's ambassador that we share in the ministry of God reconciling us to him through Christ. The first part of the scripture says, If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything is made new. The theological term for this is regeneration. We have a, another genesis. We are totally regenerated by the work of Christ and his Holy Spirit. This is a real change that happens in us, but it is also a relative change that is done for us. So that Jesus on the cross, when he does the work of our justification, taking a sinner, bearing our sin and the consequences of that sin and making us right or just for heaven, he makes a relative change for us as a new creation. We are uh, changed in our relationship to the Heavenly Father. But there's also a real change that happens within us by the power of the Holy Spirit, that the, the, the power of sin is canceled and we can live no longer by the flesh, but now by the Spirit. We have a totally new life and it comes with new desires and new thoughts and a new source of uh, food like Holy Communion. It comes with a new direction and new goals. Cecil B. DeMille, the great movie producer, wrote in his uh, journal shortly before his passing what we call now the parable of the water beetle he said one day i was sitting in my boat and a big black beetle came out of the water and climbed into the boat with me i watched for some time 
Under the heat of the sun, the beetle proceeded to die. Then a very strange thing happened. His glistening black shell cracked all the way down his back, and out of it came a shapeless mass. It quickly transformed into a beautiful, colored life. As I watched in fascination, there gradually unfolded iridescent wings from which the sunlight flashed a thousand colors. The wings spread wide as if in worship of God. Before my eyes had occurred a metamorphosis, the transformation of a hideous beetle into a gorgeous dragonfly. It dipped and soared over the water, but the body it had left behind still clung to my boat. I had witnessed what seemed to me a miracle. Out of the mud had come a beautiful new life. And the thought occurred to me, if our Creator in heaven can work such wonders with the lowliest of creatures, imagine what potential there is for the human spirit. I want you to hear this with a discerning ear, but you and I, we, are really all just ugly, dark, empty shells without Christ in us. Now, God loves this ugly shell full of possibilities. God pours his grace, wraps his grace around this darkened shell of our lives as he gives us the love of Jesus Christ. But we have to want to let it in. We have to want to be transformed in the Spirit. We must desire to have our own wings spread in worship of God as we display the colorful fruits of the Spirit in this world. Without question, God's desire for us is to leave this empty, dark shell behind and become a new life in Jesus Christ. So the first question that 2 Corinthians 5, I believe, is asking us is, what of that dark shell that is uh, still on each of us what still needs to be shed away? What of it must die in order that our new life in Christ may more fully live? What pieces of us still need to be transformed? The second part of Scripture goes on to state, So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. What a title. What a job description. What an overwhelming responsibility, really. We are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. You are an ambassador of Jesus Christ in this world. Henry Kissinger, the U.S. diplomat and Nobel Peace Prize winner, was uh, known for expecting a lot out of his staff, and he was also a senior counselor and advisor to several U.S. presidents. Once a president asked him for a memo about a very uh, complicated matter, sensitive matter, and so Kissinger followed his normal process. He went to his chief aide, and he asked him and his research assistants to begin a draft of this memo. And so they worked for days on this memo that they were going to give to Kissinger that Kissinger would then give to the president. The aide brought it to Kissinger's desk and placed it there, and a few uh, days later, it came back to the aide's desk. There was the whole memo with a note attached to the front that said, is this the best you can do, question mark. Well, the aide thought that it must be very important, and so he and his team spent another day and a half working on this memo, and they redrafted portions of it and, and, and got it uh, into a better situation, better place where they thought, and they took it back to Kissinger, left it on his desk, and, and then within like an hour, they got it back, and, and it had a note on it that said, is this the best you can do? Question mark. And so, frustrated, uh, the chief aide decided to make some minor changes here and there, tried to find any places that were not just right, and then sent it back to Kissinger's office, and just almost immediately it came back, and, and it had the same note on it, is this the best you can do, question mark, and the aide knew there is no way this man has read through this whole memo. <laughs> And so he walked down the hall, and he slammed it on Kissinger's desk, and he looked at him and said, Yes, by all means, this is the best I can do. And Kissinger looked up at his aide and said, Well, then I'll read it this time. <laughs> it 
It takes a second for some of us. We have to give to God our best. When we go out into the world with the title Christian, we are representing our Lord and Savior with everything we say, with everything we do. Our just good enough isn't just good enough. Because Jesus is going to be judged by this world by the way you and I behave and act and breathe and speak and work. Because we are Christians. We are Jesus' church in the world. And like it or not, that's what it means. The world is going to look at us to, to make decisions about the Lord and Savior, about Jesus Christ himself. Have you decided today, I'm going to be the best ambassador for Jesus? Will you make that decision tomorrow? It is a daily choice that we put our best forward for Christ. An ambassador carries the full weight of those that they serve in, in, in the community. And the power, the weight of Jesus is very mighty. His mercy, His grace. You see, the rubric for how we are loved by God is we who are made at one with God, know God's love, are immediately called to share that love with others, to love others in a way that helps them also be made at one with God. And so we are made transparent to Christ's charity, transparent to Christ's joy, transparent to Christ's hope, transparent to Christ's generosity, transparent to Christ's service, transparent to Christ's teaching, transparent to Christ's love, so that it shines right through us. Wherever we are, we are his ambassadors. You wield the authority of Christ as a new creation in him. And so while you ask yourself, what of the shell must be shed away, you must also ask, we all must ask, how can I be a better ambassador, a better representative of Jesus Christ in my home? in my workplace, in my group of friends, in my neighborhood, in my school, in my church, in the world. You remember the joy of Easter Sunday? It's, it's the most described joyous occasion of the scriptures, but it is also the most joyous occasion in the history of the world. The moment that we stop serving the risen Christ, Stop becoming ambassadors to Jesus and his resurrection is the moment we say to God, I'd rather you just have your son placed back in that tomb in that faraway ancient city. Because when he burst forth from the tomb, he came out and charged all his disciples to bear witness to the power and promise and peace of the resurrection. The whole book of Acts is every one of the disciples of Jesus doing all they can to preach and share and live the resurrection promise, the resurrection of Jesus, the good news of our reconciliation to God in this world, to represent it to everyone. In my first year of ministry, there was a, a young couple with whom I'd become pretty close that had been given some bad news. They were 21 weeks pregnant, and their wi uh, the, the mother, the wife, began preterm labor. For five days, the baby's health, the mother's health, was uh, part of our praying, and we prayed for this child to know life. On the fifth day, the baby was delivered stillborn a little girl named Margaret. She was to the hands of her creator and left behind weeping parents, Andrew and Sydney. They were confused. They were tired. They were lost. The following day, I performed a small committal service for Margaret in our uh, columbarium at the church. It was the hardest thing I did in my first year of ministry. I shared bits and pieces of this story in our living prayer study, if you were a part of that. 
You see, this, this family had been part of my Disciple One Bible study group, which was a group of about 25 of us that studied the Bible through uh, that first year I was appointed in ministry. We had spent countless hours together, and many of those hours we spent praying for one another. We prayed for Andrew and Sydney and their little baby, and then those five days we prayed for Margaret and her life and for the mother's health. And no one knows why nature or why the world takes life from us. What we as Christians do know is that the will of God is for us to have life. And so he delivers. The hope found in this story is that the baby was delivered into the hands of a perfect father. That her life will be forever filled with perfect peace, perfect love, and perfect care. We know this because we are an Easter people. Because we believe in the power of the resurrection that we have been called to bear witness to every day. The power of Christ's reconciliation to God for us. Because we are a new creation and we know in our own lives that Jesus can take darkness and make it light. He can take sin and make it oneness with God. He can take tragedy and turn it into hope. He can take despair and turn it into joy. He can even take death and make it life. We have experienced this if we have been made new in Him. And so we know what God can do. The morning after the, the baby was delivered stillborn, the morning of the committal service, I went out on a farm with some of my buddies. They had gone turkey hunting, and I went out into a field away from them to go for a run and to face God with whom I felt some bitterness. I wanted to control all things. I really didn't want the things that had happened to have happened the way they did and how they did. And I, I just felt the need to argue with God about it, I suppose. And so I ran for almost an hour as uh, tears flooded out of my eyes and the, the sweat came down my face. The pollen began to stick to my skin and burn my skin. I still remember how it felt as my throat started to close from all the pollen in the field attaching to my tears and my sweat and my nose as it was itching. And yet somehow in the midst of all of this, as I was struggling with God, I, I felt like this was the first time I ever understood springtime that there is always some pain when there is new life. That for God to bear anything new in this world, it, it, it will take some sacrifice. Easter requires Lent and the cross. We must know the darkness of those days in order to know the light and the warmth of the resurrection. For me to be greater transformed into the image of God, it will require some pain as I shed away that part of my life that is hard to give up, hard to let die. To become an ambassador of Jesus in this world is to sacrifice, whether it be self-control or self-reliance or selfishness or whatever our struggle may be, that part of the shell that still needs to be shed away, that part of us that keeps us from putting our best feet forward for Jesus each day. Later that afternoon, when we were at the committal, I, I heard the, Andrew, the, the child's dad, say, I'm so glad, Pastor David, it's a beautiful day, that it's springtime. It's God reminding us that there's always life. And as we placed Margaret's urn into the columbarium, her mother whispered, I have hope that Margaret is alive and full of joy. You see, these parents reminded us, like we all should be, in the power of the resurrection. They gave witness in their suffering that Christ was able to give them hope. 
that, that even when the world is determined to grow us away from God, we can grow more at one with God, even in pain and darkness, we can experience Christ working his reconciliation in us as he brings us closer to that assurance and hope that is life eternal in God. It's the resurrection, it's the reconciliation of Christ that allows me to know that Andrew and Sydney will one day run in the streets and fields of heaven with Margaret hand in hand with them. And today, these parents are some of the best ambassadors I know for Jesus because when someone else experiences pain and tragedy, they show up. They don't walk away from the darkness, they walk into it because they've been there. And they sit with families and they provide listening ears and prayer and a counseling heart. They want the light of Christ to shine through their own lives. The first question is, what of our lives, of your life, still needs to be shed away so that you might be made new? And the second is, today, tomorrow, will you bear witness to the resurrection? Will you be an ambassador for Jesus Christ and the power of his reconciliation? God really can take a water beetle and turn it into a beautiful dragonfly with you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. I'm Pastor Liz, and I invite our ushers to come forward for the giving of God's tithe and our offering. And as they do that, let us pray. Gracious God, as you make all things new, you give each of us the breath of new life. Wisdom, grace, forgiveness, and love. So joyfully we share the tithe and offering as we are redeemed and transformed in your generosity. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Our hymn of invitation this morning is He Touched Me, number 367. If there are those who wish to join our church by profession of faith or transfer from another congregation or through the waters of baptism, you're invited to come forward as we sing together this hymn. <laughs> Receive now this benediction. Go forth in the peace and promise of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For we have gathered to worship him, and we are sent out new creations to be his ambassadors in all the world. Go in that peace. Amen. Amen.